wow, we're wrapping up. This is us. It's gone so fast, and yet it's been so hard, right? <laughs> it's just been this amazing series that uh, has brought a lot of us together. I know Laura and I are closer than we've ever been, ever, in, our, in all of our history. And I thought we were already so close. I didn't know that we could do that. But some of these principles have really changed our lives. And especially the ones about just kind of sitting there with each other, you know, uh, and being able to hear, really hear without getting defensive or without kind of withdrawing. And, you know, if you haven't heard all of this series, you need to hear it. You need to grab it online. It's been a life changer for a lot of us. And so I want you to be a part of that. We're going to talk today about how to heal trauma in relationship. And God has given us this tool that does it. This is a little deeper than just a, your average raw spot. This is actually a relationship trauma. I read this week about a guy who loved dogs. He had given his whole life basically uh, for dogs. You know, he, he wrote books about dogs. He um, blogged about dogs. And he was redoing his um, little driveway in front of his house. And he had just finished with the trial, you know, making it all perfectly smooth. He went in for a drink of water, came out, there's dog prints in the, in the cement. And so he's kind of mumbled under his breath, but he just you know, evened it all back out, got it looking perfect again, turned around, and there was dog prints again. It was just in a matter of moments. And, and, and his neighbor's out on the front lawn watching all this. And, and uh, so he gets some twine, and he, and he kind of makes a little fence around the driveway and uh, thinks he's got that taken care of. He comes out, there's a big old dog sitting right in the middle of the driveway in the cement. And so the guy goes over and he just kicks the dog as hard as he can. And his neighbor goes, I thought you loved dogs. And he said, I I do like dogs. I I love dogs in the abstract, but I hate dogs in the concrete. (laughs) I know that was awful, but uh, hang on. This is the thing about forgiveness. All right. Forgiveness is something that we all go like, oh, that is such a sweet concept. Oh, I love that. Uh, Until it comes home to us, like it's time for you now to forgive. And it doesn't feel so good. We're going to talk about how to use this tool, though, to transform your relationships. Because that's what God wants to do this morning. So pull out your sermon notes. And let's just look together. Look at what God says in Ephesians 4, 32. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. I love that verse. That's such a sweet verse. Now, what we've done in each of these weeks, we've kind of looked into a true life, real life counseling situation. I've changed the names and not using their real names, but just call them husband and wife to protect the innocent, the guilty, whatever, right? So the names have been changed. But let's look inside another real life conversation and kind of get a feel because it helps us get a feel of what we're talking about this morning. So husband and wife are deep in in a hold me tight conversation. And you know how we talked about the air is buzzing with emotional resonance. That's what we've been talking about, how to get this going, those mirror neurons fired up, right? Let me just hold you, says husband. Tell me what you need. Wife turns to him and smiles as if she's ready to respond to his request, but suddenly her face kind of goes blank, and she stares at the floor. And then in a detached voice, she says, I was there. I was sitting on the stairs, and I said to you, the doctor thinks I probably have it, breast cancer. I've been waiting all my life knowing it was coming. My mother died of it. My grandmother died of it. Now it's come for me and her voice changes again and she sounds kind of bewildered and you brushed past me as I sat there and she almost like touches her shoulder like she could feel the brush again and you said get yourself together there's no point in freaking out and getting all upset we're not even sure if it's cancer yet just calm down we can discuss what to do Later, And then you went upstairs to your office and closed the door. You didn't come down for the longest time. You left me on the stairs. You left me dying on the stairs. And then her voice changes again. And 
kind of a cheery business-like tone. She says, well, I feel like husband and I have, uh, you know, made a lot of progress. Those, those big fights we used to have that brought us to counseling, we don't have any more. So we're probably about ready to, to wrap this thing up. Now, husband is confused by what he just heard, what just happened. The stairway conversation. Because he's confused because that happened three years ago. Three years before. And in fact, the doctor's suspicions were wrong. She didn't even have breast cancer. But eager not to stir up trouble, he just kind of agreed. Well, I think therapy is going pretty good. Maybe there's nothing left to discuss. So what really did just happen? Good thing the counselor knew. Couples are making steady progress. Tender feelings are flowing. And then it's like, wham, one of them says some event. Sometimes it seems like a tiny event, almost an event that seems inconsequential. And yet it's like all the air is sucked out of the room. It's like that warm feeling, that resonance that was going, all of a sudden turns to a chill in the air. You can almost like, like you see their breath coming out of their mouth. You know, it's just chilled. What happened? What's going on? How can one small incident have that kind of overwhelming power? Well, clearly, it's not a minor incident, at least for one of the partners, right? It's a grievous event. And certain incidents draw more in and dig down deeper in us than just a raw spot or just a hurt feeling. They injure us so deeply that they overturn our whole world. And that's what we're calling a relationship trauma. You can catch that something's a relationship trauma a lot of times if it seems like a, re, a kind of a small event, but there's big fallout. Write that down. Small event, big fallout. Judith Herman, professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, says traumatic wounds are especially severe when they involve a violation of human connection. So even though the stairway encounter was three years back, it's remained very much alive in wife's mind, in her psyche. It's slamming the door on any hold me tight moments of any possibility of her reaching for her husband. Because when wife did try to discuss her feelings, her husband minimized the incident, leaving her even more upset. So now when husband is asking his wife to trust him, to risk with him to put himself in her hand in, to put herself in his hands literally she instantly remembers I tried that once and it wasn't safe and an alarm sounds and she refuses to go there again psychologists call this the never again dictum or the never again moment no wonder that hold me tight conversation came to an end attachment researchers Jeff Simpson at of the University of Minnesota and Stephen Rolls of Texas A&M says this, lack of an emotionally supportive response by a loved one at a moment of threat can demolish the security of a love relationship. The power of such incidents lies in the searing negative answer they offer to the questions, are you here with me? Are you with me in my pain? And the truth is the test is pass or fail. A lot of times we'll go like, well, shoot, I think I at least made a C on that one, right? I mean, doing a little better than my usual F or whatever, but no, it's just pass fail. Psychologists used to think that wounds that cause these kind of traumas were always from betrayal, but as they begin to really research the pain and probe the pain of the injured party, what they found out was it wasn't as much about betrayal as safely connecting. Partners typically suffer relationship trauma at times of intense emotional stress when those attachment needs are naturally high, like a miscarriage or the birth of a child or the death of a parent or the sudden loss of a job or the pronouncement by the doctor of some serious illness. And what researchers have found is what's important is not actually the events themselves. That's why they can seem trivial sometimes, but they're not. It's the vulnerabilities they arouse in the person. That's why for some people at certain times in their relationship, a flirtation can be more devastating than even a, a full-blown affair. 
because it arises, it arouses this uh, uh, vulnerability. So the overriding lesson is you have to take your partner's hurt seriously. You gotta hang in there. You gotta ask questions. You gotta find the meaning of the, the incident. It's gotta become clear, even if it seems invalid to you, even if it doesn't seem like it's that big of a deal. And some partners try to handle these traumas by burying them, but I can always tell because the relationship cools tremendously. It's like it just cools off and it's there, but there's no intimacy. Everyday hurts are easily dismissed and raw spots can fade away, but unresolved traumas do not heal. Unresolved traumas don't heal, they fester. The more wife demands apology from husband, the more husband dismisses her with rationalizations that only confirm her sense of isolation. You didn't even have cancer. I was right after all. You got all upset about nothing, remember? I mean, I was, sometimes partners don't get it. It's so important that we do. How do we do that? How do we use this tool of forgiveness this morning? We've all <clears throat> experienced these emotional traumas in our relationships, I'm sure, as Mark was sharing what that is and what that means. Probably some things came to your mind in your marriage or in relationship with a parent or a child or someone that is special to you. And as we talk about how to have this forgiveness conversation, I want you to hold that incident in your mind and think about how you might be able to walk through it with these steps this morning. When we have a forgiving conversation, the first thing that needs to happen, the first step, is that the hurt partner needs to speak his or her pain as openly and simply as possible. And that's not always easy to do, is it? I mean, usually, at least for me, when we try to share our hurt, all of a sudden it turns into an attack of the other person, accusing them, sort of making a case against Mark. Well, you did this and said this, and that's why I feel this pain. That's not what I'm talking about in this step. It's a very personal step of simply sharing, this is how I hurt, this is when it happened, the specific incidents or situation that brought it up, and this is how I felt disconnected and I felt a loss of security and safety with you. You share that with your partner. And if it's hard for you, maybe you didn't grow up um, with the practice of sharing feelings or talking about those kind of things. So this may be a new practice for you. And I want to give you a few questions that you can ask yourself if you're thinking about that specific traumatic event in your relationship and maybe you're not quite sure what it was exactly that you did feel. What was that pain? Here are some questions that you can ask yourself that may help you begin to identify what that pain really was. At that moment, that urgent moment of need, did I feel deprived of comfort? Did I feel deserted or alone? Did I feel devalued by my partner when I desperately needed valuate, validation? Did I feel like I was important, that my feelings were important? Did my partner suddenly appear to be a source of danger to me rather than the safe place that I needed? So ask yourself those questions when you're trying to share the pain that you feel with your partner in one of these forgiving conversations. And if sharing your feelings and pain is new for you, it may take you some time to kind of sort through, like I said, what exactly you feel. And it may take some practice to begin to share that. You may, need, you may share something that you think, this is what I felt, and then come back around and later and say, you, you know what, that wasn't exactly it. It was this that I felt. And that's okay. Take the time, take the practice. And if your partner is sharing those hurts with you, you need to allow them the time and space to come back around and say, no, this was it. If they're just beginning to learn to share their feelings. And as you courageously share your pain, I wanna assure you that your listening partner is probably feeling really uncomfortable. You know, none of us like to think that we've hurt the person that we love, especially a spouse or a child. So when they begin to share those things with us, it can be really uncomfortable. Maybe your triggers are hit, those raw spots are hit, and you feel that emotion start to rise in you. I wanna encourage you, if you're the listening partner, 
to begin to coach yourself, to take a deep breath, to slow down, to stay engaged in the conversation and let your partner share that pain with you. So often, we don't wanna share our hurts with one another because we don't wanna hurt one another. I mean, I know if I share something with Mark, a situation where he has hurt me, that it's gonna hurt him because he doesn't wanna hurt me. And so we don't share, we don't go there in our relationship. But that's a catch-22 because here's the thing. If I share the pain with them, it's gonna hurt. If I don't share it with them, it's still hurting the relationship. The connection is lost, the intimacy is lost because I'm holding it back and I'm hanging on to that hurt. So the important thing in this step is choosing the pain that's gonna be productive and lead to intimacy and growth in our relationship, and that's choosing to share my hurt with him. And once we're able to understand how we've hurt one another, then we're able to move into the next steps of forgiveness. And that next step comes right on the, the heels of the partner shares and is open and honest and tries to share their feelings. And then it switches over to the injuring partner. And this is where Laura and I have a tendency uh, and we realize this is our tendency through our life. We need to understand that the injuring partner stays emotionally present and acknowledges the wounded partner's pain and his or her part in it. Until partners can, can see that this pain has been truly recognized, they're not gonna be able to let it go and they will call again and again to their partner. And when I say that, it's not like a sweet, like, I really need you to hear my pain. It might be demanding, it might be uh, avoiding, it might be, there's gonna be all these different ways of doing it. What Laura and I began to realize is that we weren't very good at listening to the other's pain because we began to either go inward and put it on ourselves and say how, think how bad we were and, or we would try to dismiss it or like Laura sometimes would just try to avoid it completely and just shut down. I would have a tendency to try to rationalize or, or, or say it really wasn't that bad kind of stuff. And you know, if we really understand attachment, it makes perfect sense that we have to go through these steps and we have to stay there because the, the question really isn't, um, do you totally understand me? And the question definitely isn't, will you help me fix this? Will you fix, you know, like, it, it, guys, your wife's never asking you to give her one, two, three, four. Here's how you fix that. She's waiting for you to listen. And when we see that the other person gets it, how we've been hurt, it, it changes everything. It, it, it flips the whole script. It's important to remember that even though the incident happened in the past, the injuring partner can make a whole new future going forward if you just stay emotionally present. And that's just huge. I feel like that number two is where so many of us drop out right there. So you have to share your pain, your personal specific pain. Your listening partner has to stay engaged and listen and hear. And the third step is that partners start reversing the never again dictums. Those things that Mark talked about earlier that we say to ourselves after these incidents happen. I'll never trust him again. I'll never share my heart with her again. I'll never go there. I'll never talk about that. We all have those things that we tell ourselves, right? And that cuts the relationship. It disconnects us from one another. And if we're gonna experience that intimacy that we long for, we have to throw out those proclamations. We have to have a whole new vocabulary. We've told ourselves those things to protect ourselves, to protect us from continuing hurt. But in order to experience forgiveness and restore the intimacy we long for, we have to set our, our partner free from that prison. We have to begin to change those things. We have to choose to change our inner dialogue, no matter how risky it may feel. And it's risky. I'm not saying it's not. Intimacy always is. Anytime you have a close relationship with somebody, risk is involved. But if you want to have the connection and you want to have the intimacy, you have to take the risk. So you have to begin to drop those I'll never, never again statements and phrases that you tell yourself and replace them with, today I choose to trust you. Today I choose to listen. Today I choose to sit with you in your pain. 
and then you can go on to the next step. And that next step, and again, this just keeps going deeper, injuring partners now take ownership of how they inflicted this injury on their loved one and express regret and remorse. And this can't take the form of an impersonal or defensive apology. It's not good enough to say, look, I'm sorry, okay? Or for the 27th time, I'm sorry. Is that helpful? Or women are so irrational, whatever, I am sorry. <laughs> and you will be, mm, say that, right? When men never get it, you big lug, you know, you're never, it's whatever, I'm sorry. No, it's, it's, it's not like that. It's really hearing and really uh, uh, doing your best to understand. And even if you don't understand why, you understand that there was pain and you're sorry for it. We have to show that our lovers, our loved ones' pain has an impact on us. Let me just tell you how husband and wife did it in counseling. Husband turns to wife and he speaks and you can hear sadness and remorse in his voice and you can see it on his face and he says this, I really let you down, didn't I? I wasn't there for you. I am so sorry. I got all overwhelmed myself and I let you stare down your enemy by yourself. It's hard for me to admit this. I don't want to see myself as that kind of person, that kind of husband who would let you down like this, but I did it. You had a right to get angry. I never saw my support as near that important, but I know now that I hurt you really, really badly. I wasn't sure what to do, so I just dithered and did nothing. I really want to try to make this better if you'll let me. This was a turnaround moment for this couple. And that was just about the perfect apology. So let's walk through it, okay? I don't know if he just fell in. Us guys, we can fall into these things every once in a while and really get it, okay? But listen to what you need to do. First, make it clear that you feel and care about the pain you caused. That's what he did. Did you hear him say that? Secondly, explicitly tell your loved one that his or her hurt and his or her anger are legitimate. Let me just tell you something. Their anger, we feel anger legitimately. It comes from an emotion. It comes from a, a thought. Now, we might go all the way back and maybe the thought is not totally legitimate. That's not what you're talking about. We're not trying to figure that out. See, that's what I would like to do with Laura when we would sit down and she would say this. I would say, I think there's some faulty thinking here. That's really helpful, you know? Um, not helpful at all. It's like, hear her, hear him. He's trying to tell you that he hurts and that hurt is legitimate. So validate it. And then own up to exactly what you did that was so hurtful. And some of you are going, like, I just, I don't, well, I'll, you keep sitting there till you see it. Laura and I did this several times over the last couple of weeks. And I, I, I got to tell you, our relationship I thought was so deep and so intimate. I thought we were there. But you know what? We went back and I realized there were some incidents that had happened down through the years that I had just lightly flitted over. That I hadn't really been there for her. And we revisited a few of those. And man, I... I in hindsight, I thought, wow, that, you did terrible there. That was horrible to me, you know, to myself. And it's like I had to sit in it, though, and to really hear her and the look on her face when she's totally validated for the first time. It, it's huge. It brought us even closer together. And then she did the same for me. And so it's so important that we do that. Another is express shame. Tell your significant other that you too feel dismayed and disappointed by your own behavior. We have a hard time with shame. Now there's an illegitimate kind of shame and there's a shaming. I'm not talking about shaming someone, but when you do something that hurts your loved one, it's okay to feel ashamed of that. Now you don't live there, but you can express that. I'm ashamed of that. I don't want to be that. And then reassure your loved one that you will now be there to help them heal. 
These are huge. The husband did exactly that as he walked through. The whole relationship flipped. I guarantee you that if you would walk through some past hurts like that, husbands, it'll flip the script on your whole marriage. But we've never done it. We never done it. We're going to have to have the courage. It takes brave people to do this. It's so much easier to dismiss. It's so much easier to avoid. It's so much easier just to go inside. So much easier even just to blame ourselves and say, well, I am a terrible person and go inside. None of that works. You have to sit with the other in this moment. And that's what we've learned is the huge breakthrough of this whole idea that changes everything. After you've gone through those first five steps in this forgiveness conversation, the last step in the process is to have the hold me tight conversation. That's what we talked about last week. And when this takes place, it's centered on this specific injury that you're talking about. Whether it was from yesterday or 20 years ago, you talk about that specific injury, maybe that thing that you thought of this morning as we started talking. The hold me tight conversation is the one that we talked about last week with a spouse who's been injured. They share now with the person who's listening exactly the, those two questions. What is my deepest fear and what do I need most from you now? And for every person in every situation, that's going to be different. I can't tell you what those answers will be, but there will be something that they need from you now. And they share that with you. And then you have the opportunity to bring healing to that relationship, to restore the connection by providing that need for them. The injured partner identifies what they need right now to bring closure to the trauma. Then they directly ask for these needs to be met, for their loved ones to respond differently from the way they did in the original incident. And it's when you've been heard And when your loved one responds in a different way, when they hear you and they meet the need that you have, that connection is reestablished. Your relationships now have the the chance to go forward and to go deeper. This healing conversation serves as kind of a, a balm to those traumas that we've experienced in our relationships with one another. That hurt and isolation, the attachment need that wasn't met. When you have this healing conversation, suddenly that attachment need is met and the connection is reestablished. The Apostle Peter one time asked Jesus, could you just explain this whole forgiveness thing? And Jesus shared a story that he said, this is how powerful it is when you forgive or when you don't forgive. Let me just read it to you out of the Bible. At Matthew chapter 18, verse 23. The lessons of forgiveness, Jesus said, in heaven's kingdom realm can be illustrated like this. There once was a king who had servants who had borrowed money from the royal treasury. He decided to settle accounts with each of them. As he began the process, it came to his attention that one of his servants owed him one billion dollars. So he summoned the servant before him and said to him, pay me what you owe me. When his servant was unable to repay his debt, the king ordered that he be sold as a slave along with his wife and children and every possession they owned as payment toward his debt. But the servant threw himself face down at his master's feet and begged for mercy. Please be patient with me. Just give me more time. I will repay you which would have been an impossible thing in Jesus' day to pay a billion dollars. Upon hearing his pleas, the king had compassion on his servant and released him and forgave his entire debt. No sooner had the servant left when he met one of his fellow servants who owed him $20,000. He seized him by the throat. He began to choke him, saying, you better pay me right now everything you owe me. His fellow servant threw himself face down at his feet and begged, please be patient with me. If you'll just give me time, I'll repay you all that is owed. Sound familiar? We've heard this before. But the one who had his debt forgiven stubbornly refused to forgive what was owed him. He had his fellow servant thrown into prison and demanded he remain there until he repaid the debt in full. When his associates saw what was going on, they were outraged. They went to the king and told him the whole story. And the king said to the servant, you scoundrel, is this the way you respond to my mercy? Because you begged me, I forgave you the massive debt that you owed me. Why didn't you show the same mercy to your fellow servant that I showed to you? In a fury of anger, the king turned him over to the prison guards to be tortured until all his debt was repaid. And then the next verse, 
I didn't put it up there. I want you just to listen to it. Jesus said this. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. That had to stun them. That had to have knocked them backwards. Uh, that, I, I remember the, the day that I realized the debt that I owed to the King of Kings. I realized that I could never, ever be what he dreamed of me being. I realized that I could never step up to that. I had sin in my life. All of us do. And I remember how I realized I owed this debt that I could never repay. And I got on my knees and I asked for mercy. And through Christ's death on the cross, I received it. And it changed everything for me. And many of you remember that day. But can I just tell you this? Here's the thing. To be forgiven is the root. To forgive is the flower. And that's what he wants us to do. This king had originally delivered this servant from prison, but the servant basically put himself right back in. And he said, I'm going to turn you over. One version calls it to the tormentors. Every king has tormentors. You know, you even see it on the Dilly Dilly commercials. He's got tormentors, right? What are the tormentors? The hidden tormentors of anger and resentment that kind of eat your heart out, that eat your stomach out, that cause, give you ulcers and blood, low, you know, high blood pressure and, and, and back pain. The tormentors that make you lie awake at night on your bed, reliving all those things that people have done to you. The tormentors of an unforgiving heart that suck every bit of joy out of the rest of your life. Forgiveness is a decision that you make. It's made on the inside. And it's to refuse to live in the past. It doesn't deny the pain. It doesn't change the past. But I'm not going to live there. And we're going to have to have courage to do it. I always have people say, oh, I just can't forget. I I can't forgive because I can't forget. There's a really amazing verse in the book of Hebrews 10, 17, that quotes God. And here's what he says. Your sins I will remember no more. Now this great God who says, I can never forget. I never forget a single thing. I know everything that's ever happened. What did he say about you and what you've done, the wrong that you've done to him? I choose to remember no more. He didn't say forget. He said, I choose not to remember. And those are really two different things. And so that's a big part of forgiveness. It's really helpful. It's a choice we make. It's not a feeling or a mood. It doesn't mean we somehow wipe out the mind record of of what happens. It just means we choose not to remember it. I kind of got a little mantra for the church in this series that I've been thinking about. and, And I really think it fits us in so many ways. But especially about forgiveness. Three things. I won't go back. I won't stay here. I choose to go forward. In fact, I want you to say that out loud. I'm going to say it. You repeat it after me. I won't go back. I won't go back. I won't stay here. I won't stay here. I choose to go forward. Choose to go forward. That's really what forgiveness is. It's God's means of letting the past go. And so many of us, we need this message today. We've been living for years under the burden of all these unresolved hurts. Some of it going all the way back to some of our childhoods. Some of us were angry at God. We thought we had a deal with him. And you say, forgive God? God didn't do any wrong. No, he didn't do any wrong. But he will still sit and listen. He knows how to do this. He will be there with us in our pain. He won't make it illegitimate. He will hear it. God, I thought we had a deal. I know. I know, little daughter of mine. I know. I know it hurts. And I know that you love me. And I know that you didn't understand. I get all of that. I care. It's time to forgive. Forgiveness will save your marriage when nothing else will. Forgiveness will repair a relationship with that wayward child or with your parents when nothing else will. Forgiveness is the key that opens a closed heart. I want to encourage you guys, if you struggle in this area or with all any of the things that we've talked about over the course of these weeks, our connection um, 
seminar is next Saturday. You can register for that on your way out today. You'll have the opportunity to sit with our counseling staff to work through some of these things, to practice, to figure out what it means to share and verbalize and put words to the things that we feel. So I hope you'll sign up to do that. You know, we all are going to experience hurt in our relationships. We're going to hurt one another. No matter how well-intentioned we are, that's just the nature of being a part of the human race and living on this fallen planet. So injuries are going to happen. They can be forgiven, but they leave scars, don't they? They leave hurts in our lives. And I want you to look with me today before we go just quickly at the beauty of scars. You know, what happens when scar tissue forms? It takes the two torn or cut edges on your body and it knits them back together so that you can be a whole unit again. That's the same thing that God wants to do in our emotional relationships with one another. Maybe there's been a tear, there's been a cut, there's been a break of that connection that you feel and you've experienced these relationship traumas. The scar tissue will come along and it'll form a healing bond between the two of you. Maybe God wants to use that in your relationship to bring those rough edges together. And eventually after you've worked through it and you've felt the healing happen, you have this beautiful story of redemption in your life and a picture of what God has done. And that's the other thing about scars, right? They tell a story. They tell a story of where you've been and God's faithfulness to you. They're proof for you. I know I have five physical scars on my body from the surgeries I had related to cancer and, and probably even more scars inside that I can't see. But I'm proud of those scars. Those scars to me are proof of life. They say I survived, I walked through that road, and I'm still alive today. One of them on my belly looks kind of like a gunshot wound, and I'm she kind of proud of that. She tells people it's a gunshot wound. She it's a better that. story, really. But those scars for me are a reminder of what God's done, that we walk together through the trauma of cancer, and we developed an intimacy like nothing I never knew with him before, and I'm grateful to have them. And I want to tell you in your relationships with God and with one another, you can survive these traumas. Scar tissue will form, but it will be a great reminder to you of all that God has done and where you've been. And your story can be one of renewal and connection as you live out before the rest of the world what God has done. I was talking to a couple in the lobby last weekend, and I'll close with this. They're newly married and she came up to me and was telling me all that this series had meant to them and all the things that they learned. And she looked over at her parents and said, I just wish that we could be like them. And she shared with me how she struggled with kind of an avoidant attachment style and said, I just really want to learn how to have a secure attachment with my new husband. And I looked at them and I shared with them, and I want you to hear this today too. The reason that her parents have a successful, loving relationship is because along the way they made the decision to do the work. They made the decision to grow and change and let God work on them and change them. That's what it takes in a marriage. It doesn't matter how long you've been married, marriage takes work every single day. Whether you've been married for 20 years or 40 years or 60 years, whether you got married when you were 20 or 60, it's going to take work. I've heard so many people across the years tell me, you know, well, we just outgrew one another. You know, we were so young when we got married. Those are just excuses, guys. It doesn't matter when you got married or how long you've been married. It's going to take work. Because here's the thing. God's not finished yet. We sang last Thursday at First Thursday that song, He's Not Finished Yet, and I love that. But that's true of you, and it's true of me, and it's true of all of us on this planet. God isn't finished yet, so it's going to require work. Remember, he said he'll complete what he started in you and me. Philippians 1.6 says this, And I am sure that God who began the good work within you will keep right on helping you grow in his grace until his task within you is finally finished that day when Jesus Christ returns. When did he say he was going to finish working on you? On the day that Jesus comes back. He's coming back. Did you know that? 
That's a whole other message, but he is. And God said, I'm going to work on you until that day. <laughs> well, he hasn't come back yet, has he? So he's still working. And one, it's going to... One lady said uh, that he's not coming back for a really long time if he's got to finish my <laughs> husband before he gets back. I was like, and that may be true. <laughs> But he's going to keep working, and it's going to require that we make the choice every day to partner with him in that work, to choose to change, to choose to grow, to choose to do the hard work of connecting on an emotional level and staying in it engaged with one another. And that's how we'll find the intimacy, the connection that we're all longing for. And that's why we wanted to share this series of messages with you guys. I hope if you've missed one of them that you'll go back. They kind of build upon one another. So if you missed a step along the way and you dive in here today, you may have a little bit of trouble. So go back. Listen to the ones that you've missed and follow along and take the steps and you're going to find a renewed intimacy and connection in your relationships. And we're excited to see all that God is going to do in us and through us as we walk through these steps. Will you pray with me this morning? God, we are so very grateful that you have committed yourself to do the work in us, that you never stop, that you'll complete what you started. And God, I pray for every one of us in this room that you would give us the courage we need to step in, to step with you and growth and change, that we would have the courage we need to share our hearts, to take the risk to open up 